Monday, November 8, 1999, in Severne, in the Lower Rhine region of France. It was 9.24 in the evening when the police got an urgent call from a place called Ingviller, 20 kilometers away. It was from someone the police knew well. We were called out to the scene of a firearm-related death at the home of a certain Mr. Mueller. He was someone we were acquainted with. He was a forensic expert in the region, and we'd worked with him often. Dr. Jean-Louis Mueller had just informed the police that Brigitte, his 42-year-old wife, had just committed suicide in the basement of their house. Warrant officer Thierry Jaeger went to the scene immediately. When he arrived, he was told that Jean-Louis Mueller had asked Dr. Michel, one of the couple's neighbors, to pronounce his wife's death in their children's game room. I found the body of the victim beneath a model train track. The body was lying flat on its back, with the right hand partially beneath the victim's buttocks. The skull had been blown apart. Organic matter and parts of the spine were strewn across the room. As with all cases like this, the area was immediately cordoned off, and a forensic coordinator started gathering evidence. Photos were taken, and a detailed sketch was drawn of the state of the room, with the precise position of each object. The firearm was found at the victim's feet. It was a 357 Magnum, which is considered a large caliber weapon. The weapon had bloodstains on it and was immediately bagged, as was a large caliber bullet found close to the body. There was a bullet hole in one wall, measured at 1 meter 17 centimeters from the ground. All the evidence seemed to confirm that Brigitte Mueller had committed suicide. There was nothing particularly remarkable about her clothing. Nothing had been torn. There were no visible traces of a struggle, as far as we could tell. A forensic pathologist was rushed to the scene to examine the body. A colleague, Dr. Sapané, studied the report of this examination very closely. The right-hand side of the face had practically disappeared and the cranium was cracked open. The brain had been forcibly dislodged from the skull. As with all firearm deaths, stubs are carried out on the victims. This is done in order to find any slight residue left by the gunshot. Burnt particles from the gunshot will be left on the skin and on different parts of the clothing. And this residue can be picked up by what we call stubs. Samples were taken from Brigitte Mueller's hands and clothes. And stubs were also taken from her husband, Dr. Mueller. He was the only witness to the fatal incident, being the only person who was in the house at the time. All the stubs were sent for laboratory analysis. The police continued their investigation throughout the Mueller's home. There were no particular signs of any struggle, or of any self-defense, or of an argument. Nothing was broken, nothing was out of place. Just a normal living household. But when they went into the kitchen, the detectives came across something surprising. There was a small wooden chopping board with a knife stuck in a small bit of paper with writing on it. The word chow was written two or three times, I seem to remember. When asked, Jean-Louis Mueller maintained that he'd only found the message just after the police had arrived. But he couldn't explain his wife's desperate act. He told us that his wife was suffering from depression and that it was him who had prescribed antidepressants. But he did not believe that this made her suicidal. At this stage of the inquiry, the police could rule nothing out. It was our job to ascertain if the body that we had found had died as a result of suicide or murder. Brigitte Müller's corpse was transferred for post-mortem to the Institute of Forensic Medicine in Strasbourg, 
Before examining the huge head injury, the pathologist looked for any signs of physical violence. For example, if someone has been held violently by the hand, bruising would show up, but this bruising could have started beneath the skin, so would only be visible once we cut open the skin. So after an external examination, we were sure that there weren't any traumatic injuries, no areas where she'd been grabbed, no sign of self-defense. The pathologist then turned his attention to the injuries caused by the bullet. So try to picture the following. There was nothing left of either cerebral hemisphere. The right side of the face was completely disfigured. And so there was only the left side of the face, which itself was considerably disjointed. The shape of the wound caught the pathologist's attention. This type of damage is typical of what we see in suicides, but normally when caused by a hunting rifle. It's true to say that it was quite rare to see such injuries from a handgun. The pathologist then tried to find the entry and exit wounds of the bullet. Within the cranium, there were traces of gunshot particles on the muscles, which showed us that the bullet had entered from the right temporal lobe. On the left parietal lobe, there was a hole typical of an exit wound because the skin had burst open in a star shape. The next stage involved working out the bullet's trajectory within the cranium. What we generally use is a long Q-tip, which we push through the entry wound and pull out through the exit wound. In this case, the trajectory of the bullet went very slightly from front to back and in a slightly upwards direction. The next thing to determine was how far away the gun was when the shot was fired. The pathologist examined the traces around the bullet's entry wound. Tests concluded that the shot had been at point-blank range, in other words, right up close to the skin. But it could have been a contact shot where the gun is in direct contact with the skin. Blood samples were taken, showing an alcohol level of 0.59 grams per liter of blood, which corresponds to about two glasses of wine. This wasn't all. There were also traces in the blood of two types of medication, both of them major antidepressants. The doses were not lethal and slightly below their actual level of efficacy. The pathologist completed his report with the results of the post-mortem and toxicology tests. The pathologists concluded that it had been a case of suicide, but they couldn't rule out the possibility that a third party had been involved in the cause. They interviewed Bridget Mueller's family and friends. The detectives learned that the months leading up to her death had been a real ordeal for her. This was because 18 months prior to this, in January 1998, a horse riding accident had dramatically changed her life. Her friend, Marie-Claire Lano, recalled the painful episode. She was behind the horse, which apparently is something you should never do, and the horse kicked out and broke her jaw. She suffered terribly from this accident. I don't know how many operations she had and was always on morphine. She tried hard to hide the pain she was going through, both physically and psychologically, particularly as she told me that Jean-Louis wasn't very supportive. She felt abandoned. She felt isolated. She was even critical of her husband for not being at her bedside. So it's true that during those months, Brigitte Mueller went through a particularly difficult period. Naturally, the police interviewed Jean-Louis Mueller as well. When I was brought in for questioning the next day, I was still in shock. The husband told the detectives that his wife was fragile and depressed. He recounted that on the evening in question, he and his wife had dined together alone. Their younger son, Alexander, nine years old, was in his room, whereas Raphael, the older son, had just left for a swimming lesson. But after the meal, the couple got into a heated discussion. She was having a go at me for not looking after her enough. 
So the discussion then started to get a bit out of hand. She was very upset and fairly aggressive, but I didn't want to make it more conflictual. So what I did was to stop the argument. I left, and I guess I said something not very helpful, like, if you don't like it, then why don't you just go to hell? I don't remember exactly the words I used. Trying to put an end to the argument, Jean-Louis Mueller went up to his bedroom, put on his pajamas, and came back into the living room. I sat down in front of the television. Brigitte said, OK, well then, I'm going to collect Raphael, who was at the swimming pool. I knew that Alexander was upstairs and that Brigitte had put him to bed. It was around 9 p.m. Jean-Louis Mueller was now by himself on the ground floor watching a film on television. It had only been going a few minutes when all of a sudden... I heard a noise, but I couldn't tell what it was. It was a noise, a loud noise, that came from the basement. So I immediately thought that she must have bumped the car into the garage door, or there was some other problem like that. So I went down into the garage, but the car hadn't moved. I looked around the basement, and then I went into the games room, which is where I found her body lying on the ground. Jean-Louis Mueller, being both a doctor and an amateur marksman, guessed right away what had happened. And immediately, there was this smell of gunshot. When you're used to shooting guns, you know exactly what it is. So I called Dr. Michel, the police, and my mother. It was about 9.24, something like that. Jean-Louis Mueller then went up to his bedroom to check if his handgun, a 357 Magnum, was still where he kept it, under the couple's bed. And I saw straight away that the gun case was lying open on the bed and that the revolver was no longer in it. I sat down, I waited, maybe five or ten minutes. But time, honestly, in moments like that, you can't judge how long. You just don't know. When you hear a noise like that in the basement, you just don't expect anything like that. It's something that marks you for life. Something that scars you for life. Mueller's version seemed believable. We could see that he was visibly shaking, but he didn't lose control. His explanations seemed totally plausible, and they never changed. His version did not alter one bit in all the time we spent with him. The detectives were given the results of the stub tests carried out on the Mueller couple. Experts, such as Jean-Luc Bosco, are able to make even the tiniest amount of gunshot residue talk. The weapon used in this case was a 357 Magnum revolver. The gaps, particularly between the barrel and the cylinder, mean that gunshot particles can be projected and dispersed more easily. These particles undoubtedly leave a residue on the hand of the person firing the gun. However, the lab tests came up with some surprising results. The specialist did not find any gunshot residue particles on the samples taken from Mrs. Mueller's hands. The specialist came up with two theories as to why there was no residue on the hands of the victim. Either the dampness in the basement prevented the fine particles from sticking to the skin, or perhaps, the second explanation that the specialist came up with was that Mrs. Mueller's hand had been found stuck under her right buttock and in contact with her trousers. So that it's possible that when the body had been moved, any particles present on the hand would have been wiped off onto the trousers and then would have disappeared. There were a number of organic particles present in the samples taken from Dr. Mueller. According to the ballistics expert, this was proof that the victim's husband hadn't washed his hands before the samples were taken. 
None of the particles present contain anything that could be consistent with gunshot residue. The expert concluded that Dr. Mueller could not have been the one who fired the gun. Taking these results into account, the police ruled out the possibility of murder. In their report, they put forward the probability of suicide. On receiving this report, the state prosecutor decided to close the case and to take no further action. They authorized the legal burial and returned the body to the family. But when Brigitte Mueller's parents and brothers heard that no further action was to be taken, they were astonished. They immediately asked for a face-to-face -face meeting with the case prosecutor. Absolutely nobody believed in the verdict of suicide. Contrary to what we were led to believe, at the time of the fatal incident, Brigitte Mueller was not at all depressed. Quite the opposite, she was rebuilding her life. Brigitte Mueller's family were after only one thing, that justice be done to find out how she died. Suicide was just not a valid explanation in their eyes. At the time of her death, Brigitte Müller was working as a librarian in the University Library of Strasbourg. The people who knew her described her as an outgoing and spontaneous woman with no particular issues. She liked meeting new people and got on with everyone. She was not a snob. Brigitte, as far as I'm concerned, was the most well-loved woman that I knew. Brigitte was someone who loved to write, and she was always writing poems. She loved the beautiful things in life, such as literature and the Italian Renaissance. And she was absolutely passionate about opera. For a few weeks before the fatal incident, Brigitte spent a lot of time with friends. In fact, she was invited by some of these friends to dinners. And everyone agreed that Brigitte was once again happy and sparkling. The last time I saw Brigitte, she told me, Listen, Mary Claire, please don't worry about me. I'm much better now. I promise I'm doing really well. And she was really quite insistent. Two months before her death, Brigitte Müller wrote a letter to a friend which confirmed this resurgence. When you have your health and you're no longer in pain, then I realize how much you can appreciate life. So when her close friends and family heard about Brigitte's suicide, they were shocked. It just didn't seem like something she'd do. I find it very hard to understand her suicide because she loved her son so much and her family. It's so difficult to comprehend. What shocked the family about the verdict of suicide was, firstly, the fact Brigitte really hated guns. In fact, she absolutely had no idea how to handle a weapon. Secondly, how could she possibly have left a family photo next to a chopping board with a knife stuck into it and the words chow chow written on notepaper? It just didn't correspond to the Brigitte they knew and loved. And so therefore, the family suspicions turned to Jean-Louis Müller, who had an angry disposition and in their eyes was her killer. Severin's prosecutor decided to reopen the case. And this time, he drew attention to some puzzling facts, beginning with the statements made by the police on the night of the events. There had been no search carried out by the police of the family home where the fatal incident had taken place. Jean-Louis Müller's clothes had not been taken away for examination. What's more, the police didn't even take a single photo of Jean-Louis Müller that evening. And the younger son, who was present in the house, was not even questioned. So it seemed that there were a number of flaws in the first police investigation. The prosecutor even wondered if Dr. Müller's status had in fact worked in his favor. Think about it. The police knew Jean-Louis well. He was well known in the area. He was a doctor and a forensics expert. The police were deferential towards him. And this was not surprising, as the doctor was himself a member of the military unit of the gendarmerie. 
Jean-Louis Jean Mueller was a lieutenant colonel in the reserves. He had huge respect for the army. He could talk for hours recounting great military battles. He was an absolute expert on the Second World War. He could even have had a military career himself. Had the police investigation been botched because of their friendship with Dr. Mueller? The investigation had been carried out in a proper fashion. Nothing had been glossed over. People often said, oh yes, Mueller was in collusion with the police. Absolutely not. They did exactly what they had to do. I didn't call them and say, my wife has committed suicide, can you close the case? No, it wasn't like that. Everything was done properly and by the book. And thank goodness for that as far as I'm concerned. Nevertheless, the prosecutor uncovered some more surprising information. Jean-Louis Mueller was a keen marksman and went to the shooting range regularly. And not only was he passionate about firearms, but he was very knowledgeable about the injuries they could cause. It mustn't be forgotten that during his time as a medical student, he wrote a thesis on firearms and the different range of results when used. This expertise portrayed Dr. Mueller in a totally different light. Jean-Louis Mueller was a forensic expert and knew exactly how to handle firearms. If there was anyone who could, and I say it hypothetically, dress up a crime scene, it was he. Now, when the prosecutor read through the police interviews, he came across an astonishing inconsistency. In his statement, Dr. Mueller claimed that at the time of the fatal incident, he was in his pajamas watching television. Yet his neighbor, Dr. Michel, said that when he arrived first on the scene, Jean-Louis Mueller was still wearing his daytime clothes. Either Jean-Louis Mueller had lied, or he'd had the time to get changed to change his clothes. So there was a real element of doubt that crept in. And this doubt led the state prosecutor to call for the opening of a formal criminal investigation. On March 17, 2000, more than four months after the fatal incident, an investigating magistrate was appointed. The investigation was put in the hands of the Met's criminal branch, who started everything from scratch in order to determine if Brigitte Mueller had really committed suicide or if she'd been murdered by her husband. They interviewed Dr. Michel, the neighbor, again. He confirmed that Jean-Louis Mueller was not wearing pajamas that evening. When Dr. Mueller was asked about this, this was his explanation. When I made the statement, I said, yes, I'd gone upstairs to put on some pajamas. It was just an image. All I did was take off my daytime outfit to put on something more casual, to relax in front of the television, that's all. I'm not really the sort of person who likes to sit down in front of the TV in a suit and tie. The neighbor also told the detectives that he'd been Jean-Louis Mueller's associate in the past, but that the two of them had not got on for over 10 years. Nevertheless, it was Michel that Mueller called for help on the night of the drama. Dr. Michel even said to the detectives that he had been very surprised that Mueller had rung him. Why him, when they practically stopped speaking to each other for years? The detectives heard more surprising revelations from Dr. Michel, especially as they totally contradicted Jean-Louis Mueller's statements. Dr. Michel generally went to pick up his son from the pool, as well as the older Mueller boy, every Monday evening after the swimming lesson. However, Jean-Louis Mueller had initially told the police that that particular evening, Brigitte was going to pick up their son. There was a discrepancy. But Mueller maintained that he told the truth about his wife. I didn't really take any notice, because it's true that every so often she would go and pick up Raphael, but only once in a while. So did she use that as an excuse to go down into the basement? In all honesty, I think so. The investigating magistrate wanted to find out more about Brigitte Mueller's mental state at the time of her death. Psychiatrist Dr. Henri Brunner was appointed to look into the matter. He found out that after her horse accident, a whole year before her death, 
Brigitte Mueller had been to a psychiatrist because she was suffering from a loss of self-confidence. The psychiatrist saw her four times and with admirable clinical insight prescribed nothing for her, especially as she was already taking an antidepressant prescribed by her husband. So after four sessions, she was a lot better. She'd gained in confidence and the story stopped there. At the end of the process, the psychiatrist's assessment was that Brigitte Mueller was not suffering from any pathological depression, which would have caused her to commit such a serious act. Nothing indicated that she had any symptoms which might have driven her to have suicidal thoughts, or to make a suicide attempt, or even to commit suicide itself. Brigitte Mueller saw her psychiatrist for the last time, just one month before she died. She used the opportunity to talk about her relationship with her husband. Brigitte and Jean-Louis were very different as a couple because Jean-Louis was quite domineering. He had a very strong personality, as they say, whereas Brigitte was less complex and very affectionate. I think there was a big gap between Brigitte's need for affection and the I'm the head of the family, I'm the doctor, I know everything side of Jean-Louis. Jean-Louis Muller has his own explanation for this. I think we complemented each other well. I was more of the pragmatist, but not in an overbearing way. And she was certainly the romantic one. I wouldn't go as far as to say in an empty-headed way, but perhaps more superficial. However, during her last consultation with the psychiatrist, Brigitte Mueller had also complained about the conflictual relationship she'd always had with her parents-in-law. Brigitte ne se sent Bridget had never really found her place in the Mueller family clan. She'd often been the object of criticism, particularly over the fact that she hadn't come from a wealthy family herself. It's important to point out that Dr. Mueller's family were known in the region as gentry, as we used to say in the past. They weren't really blue-blooded aristocrats, but in their little part of the woods, they had status, huge wealth, and considerable social standing. Her mother-in-law had actually come out and said, we didn't want Brigitte in the family, neither me nor my husband. Those were her exact words. Brigitte Mueller told her psychiatrist that after 17 years, her marriage had become stale. And she admitted that she'd met someone else a certain Jean-Pierre, who worked at the French National Center for Scientific Research. Both of them shared a keen interest in art and literature. They would meet up for walks around Strasbourg and write each other letters. It seemed obvious that a romance was blossoming. It seems that they had kissed in public in Strasbourg city center only three days before the fatal incident. On the day itself, Brigitte had a phone conversation over the landline of the family residence with Jean-Pierre. So what if Jean-Louis Mueller had overheard this conversation? Could this telephone call have been the real cause of the argument between the Mueller's that fatal evening? The detectives began to wonder if they hadn't come across the motive for a crime of passion. Even more so, when during further questioning, they uncovered another worrying piece of information. Brigitte had confided in her parents, telling them that she actually feared for her safety, that relations with her husband had become quite difficult, and that she felt threatened by him. She'd even gone so far as to tell one of her friends, if anything happens to me, you mustn't believe what he says. And yet, there was no material proof that could back up the murder theory. One by one, every bit of evidence in the file was re-examined in detail. Starting with the 357 Magnum revolver, which had been sent away to the IRCGN, the forensic laboratory of the Gendarmerie Nationale. The task of testing for fingerprints had been assigned to Jacques Buzat. The police were astounded by his findings. <laughs> 
I didn't find any evidence on the revolver of any fingerprint traces coming from either Mrs. Mueller or from Dr. Mueller. This is rather peculiar, I would say, because one almost always finds fingerprints on this type of surface. Normally, there are plenty of traces on firearms. The expert put forward two theories as to the reason why there were no fingerprints. It could have been that the person who took the shot had their hands protected by gloves or by some other substance. Or the second possibility is that the weapon had been cleaned up. Clearly, the victim had not been wearing gloves. According to Jean-Louis Muller, the only explanation possible was that the gun had been cleaned. The 357 Magnum belonged to him, and as an amateur marksman, he used this gun regularly for practice. You go to the shooting range, you practice your shooting, and then when you finished, you clean your firearm. Normally, I clean the gun at home on the kitchen table. Cleaning firearms usually requires a special oil, and the forensic expert did indeed find a large quantity of this oil on the revolver. The oil will automatically mask any fingerprints. I put in my report that the gun was oiled, in fact, extremely well oiled. The detectives wondered if Jean-Louis Mueller had wiped off his fingerprints by deliberately cleaning the weapon after having shot his wife. But something still didn't add up. We found one or two very visible traces of brain tissue, of organic matter, both on the barrel and near the trigger. So the question was, if Jean-Louis had really cleaned the weapon after having used it, how come there were still traces of organic matter on the barrel or on the trigger? It wouldn't have been possible. So the presence of cleaning oil on the firearm had prevented any fingerprints from being detected. Even the case where the gun was normally kept was tested thoroughly. But once again, Jacques Pesillat could find no traces of Brigitte or Jean-Louis Mueller's prints. And he could provide no explanation for this. Suicide or murder. To try to get to the bottom of the mystery, the investigating magistrate ordered a ballistics report from the police forensic laboratory of Lille. Everything was tested thoroughly, from the position of the 357 Magnum on the ground, the path of the bullet, and the type of ammunition. The specialists studied the photos taken at the time of the discovery of the corpse. They came across an interesting detail. The position of the weapon found at Brigitte Mueller's feet. The firearm had moved in the opposite direction to that of the bullet. In other words, the movement of the weapon was like this. We know that if I used a firearm like this, the Ruger 357 Magnum caliber revolver with my right hand, the recoil would be like this, and the gun would not end up at my feet, but somewhere different. But this wasn't the case. The bullet's path also produced some questions. At the post-mortem, the pathologist had reported that the bullet had gone horizontally through Bridget Mueller's head. But for the ballistics team, this angle would have made the act of suicide difficult. If you adopt what would seem to be the most natural position to commit suicide, it would be this. But actually, holding it in this way makes it very difficult to press the trigger because the wrist is bent and you don't have enough strength to press it. Then the specialists looked into how the cylinder had been loaded. There were two new cartridges and three empty cases. In other words, three bullets that had already been used. If it was Brigitte Mueller who'd loaded the revolver, it didn't make sense. Because if she was going to put an end to her life, why would she have put spent bullets in the cylinder? The conclusion from the police lab's ballistics expert was that Either the person who had loaded the cylinder knew absolutely nothing about loading guns and therefore wasn't able to distinguish an empty case from a cartridge, or it had been staged. A weapon without fingerprints, loaded in a haphazard way, and found inexplicably at the victim's feet. 
the ballistics conclusions suddenly made the verdict of suicide look less likely. The tests didn't stop there. A counter-analysis was carried out on the stubs taken from the Mueller couple when looking for gunshot residue. The first tests had not found any gunshot particles on Bridget Mueller's hand. The specialist at the time had explained that this was due to the dampness of the basement, or due to the position of the dead woman's hand under her buttocks, which would have erased any traces. But after the second set of tests, the specialists agreed that the absence of any particle residue was totally incompatible with the suicide scenario. There's a cloud of gunshot residue which escapes from the gun when it's fired and will seriously contaminate the back of the hand. It is therefore totally impossible to shoot this firearm and not have residue particles land on one's hand. And so that completely invalidates Mrs. Mueller's suicide. As for the stubs taken from Jean-Louis Mueller, they too showed no traces of residue, neither on his hands nor on his clothes. The first specialist had therefore concluded that Dr. Mueller could not have fired the gun. But when the lead laboratory re-examined this evidence using new detection technology, the results were damning. When the samples taken from Dr. Mueller's hands were tested, we found significant amounts of particles indicating they were from gunshot residue. These particles had, without a doubt, come from the firing of a gun. The investigating magistrate believed that he finally had proof that Jean-Louis Mueller had killed his wife. On November 6, 2001, a full two years after the fatal incident, Jean-Louis Mueller was taken into custody. First of all, I just didn't understand, as with any mistaken arrest, obviously. I was being accused of having killed my wife, so naturally it felt like the end of the world. According to them, it was a case of a crime of passion, in which Brigitte had wanted to leave me for her lover. I'd taken it badly. I got my gun out, dragged her into the basement and shot her. That was it. That was their story. Old Dr. Mueller in a fit of jealous rage. And then they told me all sorts of things, like, we found gunshot on you, but not on your wife. Do you see what they were doing? Feeding me a few little elements, hoping that I would confess. When he was questioned about the gunshot residue on his hands and clothes, Dr. Mueller gave the following explanation. He was sure that he'd been contaminated by coming into contact with his wife's dead body. When a gun is fired in a room, there is an aerosol effect, meaning that the gunshot will be dispersed in the room and then fall and settle. So with Jean-Louis arriving quickly on the scene and going straight to his wife, there was so much gunshot in the air that it's obvious that a lot of it would settle on him. It's like when people used to smoke in cafes and you came out with a horrible smell of tobacco on you. It more or less is the same idea. However, what Jean-Louis Mueller said in his defense didn't convince the detectives leading the case. And after two days of questioning, he was charged with murder and was remanded in custody. The police now had to work out how Jean-Louis Mueller had managed to kill his wife and dress it up as a suicide. The investigating magistrate decided to bring a lesional ballistics expert onto the case someone specialized in bullet-induced injuries. From the outset, the specialist was troubled by Brigitte Mueller's gunshot wound. According to him, the 357 Magnum revolver, a key piece of evidence from the beginning, was not the weapon that had blown her head off. The gun barrel was right up close or in contact with the skin. 
Now, a bullet carries with it a large amount of gas under high pressure. So when you take a closed box and you inject a large volume of gas under high pressure, what do you think happens? The box will explode. So for the specialist, this huge amount of gas would be consistent with a shot from a hunting rifle. Because normally, there wouldn't be enough gunshot in a 357 Magnum to produce enough gas to blow someone's hat off. Unexpectedly, the specialist put forward a new theory. Jean-Louis Mueller must have used another weapon, a hunting rifle, to help disguise the murder of his wife. A whole new crime scene scenario is being written. They claimed there'd been a first shot fired from a distance. Mrs. Mueller was wounded. But the shot hadn't blown her head off. She was lying on the ground, and Dr. Mueller had taken another weapon, a clay pigeon shotgun, and fired at her point blank, which this time did blow her head off. This scenario was plausible, given Dr. Mueller's area of expertise, and that he was totally capable of erasing any signs of murder. The idea that Jean-Louis Mueller would have been able to disguise the crime by using a second weapon was totally feasible, because he was a firearms expert and had written a thesis on the use of firearms and their consequences. The judge said to me, so, because you're a forensic doctor and you're a marksman, you must therefore be capable of putting in play a sophisticated scenario. In other words, I was guilty because I was capable of doing it. I would say in reply, you own a Porsche, you can drive at high speed, so you must have broken the speed limit. But you have to prove that the speed limit was broken. To try and prove Jean-Louis Mueller's guilt, the investigating magistrate ordered another examination of the evidence. This time, in order to confirm that Bridget Mueller's injury could not have been caused by a 357 Magnum revolver. But the results of the analysis cast more doubt on the matter. The specialist categorically stated that it was possible for a 357 Magnum to cause this amount of damage. Firstly, because in his professional experience, he'd already come across such situations. Secondly, there are records of such cases. And lastly, the type of cartridges that Dr. Mueller used were not just ordinary everyday ones. They were overloaded with gunshot. As for Jean-Louis Mueller, he continued fighting to prove his innocence. He asked the investigating magistrate to set up a reconstruction at the scene of the dramatic events. He suggested they go down into the basement, reconstruct the room as it was at the time, and reconstruct the events so they could see if the evidence for what he was being accused of stood up or not. For this type of case, it was imperative to carry out a reconstruction to maintain a certain scientific rigor. This sort of incident could only be resolved by testing out what was known about the weapon, the head, the injuries, and the blood and tissue splatter. However, the courts didn't uphold Jean-Louis Mueller's request, despite his insistence and that of his lawyer. We asked the investigating judge, it was turned down. We asked the Court of Appeal, turned down too. We asked the criminal court of first instance, turned down again. Jean-Louis Mueller was refused a fair trial. This was an attack on his fundamental right to a proper defense. This case was a disaster and brought the criminal justice system into disrepute. On March 19, 2010, 10 years after Bridget Mueller's death, her husband tried one last time to get things overturned. St. Pierre and I decided to do a private reconstruction. In an attempt to counterbalance the systematic and outright rejection of our requests, 
And so we carried out this reconstruction with a judicial officer present, and we tried to imagine all the possible and impossible scenarios. For example, in a kneeling position, an upright position, shooting from distance, and so on. We did everything. They asked Patrice Mongin, distinguished professor of forensics at the universities of Geneva and Lausanne, to carry out the reconstruction. We were able to do this because the scene of the crime still existed. The room had been cleaned up, of course, but its configuration hadn't changed. With the help of actors, Professor Mongin reenacted the three hypotheses. First, murder with the weapon in touching distance. Then, the hunting rifle theory. And finally, the suicide theory. All of a sudden, an element from the crime scene, which up to then had been ignored, took on vital significance. The spattering of blood and skin tissue around Brigitte Mueller's corpse. If the perpetrator had indeed been in the room, he would obviously have been contaminated, even covered, I would say, by splatter, as had been the walls, the ceiling, and even the board on which the model train track was built, as well as the ground. In other words, if the perpetrator was right next to the victim, his own body would have acted like a shield and prevented a certain amount of splattering from taking place. The layout of the splatter proved that no one could have been next to Brigitte Mueller when the trigger was pulled. As for the scenario of a first gunshot from a distance, followed by a rifle shot up close, this would imply that the victim had already been lying on the ground when the splattering took place. But according to Professor Mongin, this position was incompatible with his findings. If the gun had been fired on the victim lying on the ground, then in that case, the boards on which the model train track was built would not have been contaminated on the top, but from underneath. Underneath the model train track, there was not a single bit of organic spatter or brain tissue. That means that Mrs. Mueller's head was blown away when she was standing over the train tracks. It didn't happen when she was lying down. The reconstruction showed clearly that if, during the investigation, we'd studied how the different bits of the body had been dispersed around the room, we'd have noticed that suicide was the only possible explanation and that there was no one complicit and no witnesses. But the investigating magistrate refused to incorporate the conclusions of the private reconstruction, proving Jean-Louis Mueller's innocence, into the case file. All in all, the investigation into Brigitte Mueller's death lasted 14 years. During all this time, Jean-Louis Mueller was suspected of having murdered his wife, and yet he always claimed his innocence. Being convinced beyond reasonable doubt has nothing to do with solving riddles. It just means there's a threshold of proof that must be reached before someone can be convicted. Jean-Louis Mueller was a victim of an archaic criminal justice system. And that's when you realize just how much the judicial system is a machine which crushes you under its wheels. It's not a system designed to understand. It's a machine which is set on a course and crushes everything in its wake. The judges know that full well. Even if you're acquitted or discharged on a social level, they've managed to kill you off. The search for the truth went on for 14 years, over a death which scarred the people involved with Brigitte Mueller for life. I would love nothing more than for that horrible day never to have happened, and that Brigitte and her husband would still be around, growing old together. As grandparents, I sometimes dream that she's still with us.